Thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting my channel. Watch the extended cut of this video when you sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula using the link in the description. So this is going to be a bit of an odd video for this channel, but since we are coming up on the end of the year, which is around the time that PhD applications are typically due in the sciences, and for anyone who's starting to consider whether or not they'd like to apply for a PhD in the fall, I thought it might be useful to tell you guys my six top tips for applying to PhD programs coming from someone who is a PhD student in medical engineering and medical physics through the Harvard MIT Health Sciences Technology Program. And of course, before we get too far into it, a disclaimer, these tips are based on my experiences applying to grad school about three years ago. They are based on what worked for me and what were my priorities at the time. So if you're applying to other types of programs and other regions, then they may or may not work well for you. But I think that these are the things that really stood out to me as being a big factor in ending up at the program that I'm in now. And if you have questions or you've applied to grad school and you have advice for people, definitely leave that in the comment section so that we can share advice with each other. So with that, let's get into it. Tip number one is to ask yourself whether or not you actually want to do a PhD. And this is a really important question because PhDs are long. They're five to seven year long degrees where you spend most of your time trying to expand the sum total of human knowledge that currently exists on any given topic. And it's not easy. In fact, it can be really hard. You can have some darker points because things might not be working as well as you wanted them to. So it's really important to make sure that you're making an informed decision and that the PhD is actually the thing that you want. In particular, it might be helpful to look at people who are in jobs that you'd like to have after your PhD and see what kind of degrees they have, what kinds of experience they have. And if you have the opportunity to actually talk to them about what they're looking for, for people who are coming into that field to give you a sense of whether or not the PhD is necessary or whether you can get away with a master's or something similar. In addition, if you've never done research before, I'd highly recommend getting some experience in it. Most programs won't actually admit you if you don't have research experience anyway, because at the end of the day, that's what they're hiring you for. Doing a PhD is a job and they're hiring you to do research. So even if your grades aren't perfect or your letters of recommendations aren't amazing, they want to know at the very least that you've done this before in some capacity. On your end, doing research will give you a taste of what the next several years of your life will be like as someone who did research as an undergrad as well as in high school. It certainly isn't the full picture of what doing a PhD is like, but I definitely think that had I not had the experience of doing research before coming here, I would have had a much rougher time. And this brings me to my second tip, which is talk to your mentors, talk to your professors if you're still in school or still in contact with them about the process of applying and what you're interested in. These are people who are generally familiar with your field and they probably have an idea of what types of programs or what areas you might want to look for to get the kind of degree or the kind of research experience that you want. They may also be able to talk to the people at those programs and get a sense for what labs are recruiting for people with what kinds of backgrounds, which can be helpful. For me, I actually cold email probably about 60 faculty across 20 or so schools. And the thing that I really learned from that was that a lot of the places that I really thought I wanted to go to when I was starting to apply just weren't taking students in the areas that I wanted to do research. So if I had applied to those programs, I might have gotten in, but there wouldn't have been anyone there that I actually wanted to work with. And given that applying to grad school costs about $100 a program, it wouldn't have been worth it. On that note, those faculty or mentors may also be able to point you to resources for fee waivers. So as I mentioned, applying to grad school usually costs about $95 to $115 a school. And most programs actually have fee waivers where they will let you waive the fee under certain circumstances. So it's always good to ask the admin for the program if you can get a fee waiver because applying to grad school is really expensive and not everyone has the cash ready to do that. My third tip has to do with deciding on which programs to apply to. And this might actually be a little bit controversial depending on who you talk to. I see both sides of this. I just happen to go with one side and that's to apply to places and areas that you know you're okay living in. The counter to this is that you should apply everywhere, including places that you might not want to live in, and then see where you get in and decide from there. But I personally don't love that approach because if there's a certain part of the world that you absolutely know that you wouldn't like living in, and it's also the part of the world that has the only program that you got into, then 
do you actually want to go to that program even though you're going to be miserable the whole time? Personally, I applied to broad regions that I knew that I would be happy living in because at the end of the day, it's, as I mentioned, not an easy degree. And the last thing you want to do is have a bad day in lab, but also come home and be miserable because you hate the place that you live. My fourth tip has to do with the actual process of applying, so your application materials. And my tip is to show your materials to as many people as possible for feedback. I was a bit lucky because I did a summer research program before I was applying to schools during my senior year. And part of that program was getting GRE prep. It was having someone look over my personal statement, having someone look over my CV, look at my letters of rec and give feedback to my advisors, which I certainly did not go back to my advisors and tell them that someone thought that they should change XYZ thing of their letter. But in any case, all that feedback is really important because it's coming from people who have been through the process before. In particular, I got feedback from both graduate students who had been through the process on the student side, but also from faculty who had been through the process from the admissions side and knew what they were looking for in incoming cohorts. And this isn't to say that you have to take all the advice that you get. In fact, if you send it out to a lot of people, you'll probably get so much feedback that you won't actually be able to take all of it into account because some of it might contradict each other. But I think that having all of the feedback in the first place is really helpful because it gives you a sense of how people coming from different backgrounds from your own will see your application and it can help you tailor your application such that the admissions committee looks at all of your materials and sees the story that you want them to see versus a story that they put together by themselves. I'll also say, and this is a common question that I get about applications and admissions process, when it comes to things like transcripts, GPA, GRE, obviously do as well as you can on all of those things, but by the time you get to the point where you're within a couple months of applying, there isn't a ton that you can do about those. So that's why I think that showing materials that you can actively change to other people is important, because you want to have a story in mind that you're trying to tell the admissions committee that will persuade them to let you in, and you have to craft that story around the things that are already somewhat set in stone. Finally, when it comes to materials, just make sure to ask your letter writers for letters as early as possible. I always had letter writers who were happy to write me letters, but there were definitely cases where people were too busy or didn't have time. And so knowing that you have all of your letter writers ready to go is super helpful. It's also helpful because they might ask you for materials to help them write the letter. In fact, I had some letter writers who had me draft the letter myself. And doing that can be a little bit intimidating at first. In fact, I found it super intimidating when I first did it. But at the end of the day, they're going to take that draft and rewrite it in their own voice. And you're just giving them the information that you think is important and that you think that the program will think is important so that they can be sure to include that information in their final draft. My fifth piece of advice comes to interviews and some programs, depending on where you're applying and how the program works, will have interviews, some don't. In fact, for me, for the programs that I either got an interview or were admitted to directly without an interview, HST, which is the program that I'm currently in, was one of two programs that had formal interview processes and the others had visit weekends. And my biggest piece of advice when it comes to interviews is that it's just as much about you interviewing them as it is about them interviewing you. And that's to say that programs are looking for people who obviously have stats that meet their requirements, have research experience, but also people who will be a good fit for the program and deciding whether or not someone is a good fit is a two-way street. The admissions committee needs to decide whether or not they think that you'd be a good fit for their program, but you need to decide whether or not you think that their program is a good fit for you too. And this comes down to more than just the research experiences that you might be able to get there. It comes down to the culture of the department. It comes down to things like stipend potentially. It comes down to the people that you're going to be around. So, so you should obviously present the best version of yourself, the version of yourself that you want to be admitted, but also make sure to keep in mind that if you go through the interview process and there's something about the program that creeps up that you realize that you don't really like and that just doesn't really mesh with you, then maybe that means that that's not the right program for you and that's totally fine. Personally, one of the things that I didn't expect when I applied to grad school was that when it comes to the actual ranking of the different programs that I applied to, I thought that I would get into programs within a certain tier, so lower ranked programs to mid ranked programs. And it turned out that I actually got into some programs that I thought were an absolute pipe dream, including the program that I'm currently in, and didn't get into some programs that I thought would be a shoe in for. And at the end of the day, the reason why I think I didn't get into some of those programs was fit. 
For example, there was one program that I applied to that I thought that I would get into, and after talking to some of the faculty, I realized that most of the faculty in that department did ultrasound research. And I wasn't interested in ultrasound research. There was one or two faculty members who didn't do that kind of research, and those were the people I was interested in. And so from the admissions perspective, if I wasn't able to get a position in one of those two labs, I wasn't a good fit for the program anymore because there was no one else there doing research that I was interested in. So it made sense for them to reject me because there was a pretty high chance that I wouldn't be happy there and that I wouldn't be doing research that I was actually interested in. This is all to say that I know that people often laugh or think that programs are being insincere when they say that the admissions process is holistic, but there is an element of fit that comes into this that is important in deciding who gets into what program because they want to make sure that it makes sense for both you and them. And you should try to make sure through the interview process that it does make sense for you. Finally, my last piece of advice has to do with deciding what program you want to go to, and this actually ties into the interview process thing a little bit. And that's to say that there's more to that decision than just rankings and prestige. And I know that might sound a little bit weird coming from me who goes to a Harvard and MIT co-run PhD program, but it can be really hard to make these decisions. In fact, I had gotten into a different program at MIT in January and had gotten into another Boston area school by about February. And assuming that I wasn't going to get into the program that I'm in now, I was having a really tough time figuring out which program to go to because the second program was obviously slightly lower ranked, but I could tell pretty early on that the MIT program just wasn't a great culture fit for me. It wasn't somewhere where I really wanted to spend six years. And had I not gotten into the program that I'm in now, I don't know if I would have chosen to go to MIT because at the end of the day, I figured out that when it comes to program fit, MIT wasn't necessarily, or that department at MIT wasn't necessarily the best place for me. There are also other things that go into this decision, stipend being one of them. I highly recommend if you get to interview or visit a school to talk to current students and ask whether or not the stipend is actually a livable one. And this is an important note that I probably should have mentioned earlier, but for people who aren't aware, PhD students in STEM fields, so science, technology, engineering fields, typically get paid for their PhDs. I, MIT's average stipend is about $40,000 a year pre-tax for PhD students in the sciences. So keep in mind, you get paid to do this. You usually get paid enough to live on, but depending on the program, what enough to live on means can vary a lot in terms of the quality of life that you might have. So make sure that it's a program that is a culture fit, that is a research fit, that will let you do the types of things that you want to do, whether that be intern during your PhD or have clinical experiences like what I was looking for, and that you'll have enough money to live on and live relatively comfortably, as comfortably as a grad student does. All right, I'm gonna stop here for now because as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the style is a bit of an experiment since it's a little bit different from what we normally focus on on this channel. In fact, I don't tend to experiment with content styles on this channel that much because it risks the YouTube algorithm deciding that it's a bad video. However, you can find the extended cut where I delve more into how I decided where to go to grad school on Nebula, a creator-built platform where you get to watch my videos ad-free and we can create an experiment with awesome content without having to worry about demonetization or paying tribute to the YouTube algorithm. We're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction videos. In fact, since it's the end of the year, you might want to watch their documentary on the top science stories of 2020, or gift a CuriosityStream and Nebula bundle to someone else who likes my videos or loves nonfiction documentaries. Where CuriosityStream is all about big budget nonfiction documentaries, we're building Nebula so that education and creators have a place to experiment with new content that might not work on YouTube. In fact, we were recently nominated for a streaming. On Nebula, you'll find ad-free videos from some of your favorite creators from TierZoo to Neurotransmissions to The Coding Train. You can also find my Nebula Journal Clubs or watch Questionable Advice, a Nebula original where Vanessa Hill from Braincraft tries to help me order less takeout. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so if you click on the link in the description or use my promo code JORDAN, you can get access to CuriosityStream for 41% off their annual plans with a limited time holiday discount. And Nebula is included for free for as long as you are a CuriosityStream member. That's less than $12 a year. Signing up for CuriosityStream and Nebula is a great way to directly support my channel, so give yourself or a loved one the gift of curiosity stream and Nebula this holiday season by using the promo code Jordan or by signing up for curiositystream.com slash Jordan. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also check out my video on how I organize my life as a PhD student in case you're curious about how I balance YouTube and PhD work. Otherwise, you can follow my PhD life on Twitter and Instagram, and I will see you guys on Monday in the new year.
Bye.